Joining me in the Catalyst studio today is Jeff Dyer. Welcome, sir. Good morning. So you've been in the fitness world for many, many years, and we're going to do what I'm excited about is a long origin story that goes back to a very well-known chain of, of uh, fitness centers and, and then moved on to another no, well-known chain of fitness centers. So let's start by going like we like to do, going way back. So when did your entrepreneurial journey start? Uh, well, I basically started in Australia. I was a uh, an overweight teenager, weighed about 250 pounds at 18 years of age and uh, joined a gym in Australia and lost that weight in about three months. And it, it changed my life and uh, inspired me about the value of exercise and proper diet. And uh, my father uh, invited me to travel around the world with him at the age of 22, 23 years of age. And uh, we went through Europe, landed in uh, Oklahoma City, stayed with some friends of my father that bought some clubs there. And I was invited to take a job as a front desk attendant, later worked my way into a management role. And a year and a half later, the company was sold. But that first introduction to fitness was a great one. I loved the business. I loved working with people, loved seeing people's lives change. And it was inspired me to continue in my career. Had a choice of going to Texas and coming to Florida, moved to Florida and uh, worked for an independent group actually based out of uh, this area, right in uh, Central Avenue and 34th Street North and uh, worked in independent clubs. And uh, eventually a member walked into the club and said that he had watched me and wanted to back me opening a club in Lakeland, Florida. And he bought a piece of property that had a building of 6,000 square feet and adequate parking. But it only had one way into the property, which didn't work for the members. There's only one way to get <laughs> in and out of the back parking area. So we bought some more land. Anyway, bottom line is he ended up funding me, and that became the start of uh, Lifestyle Family Fitness. To give away the punchline there. <laughs> Did I? Okay. <laughs> All right. So let's back up a little bit. Yep. Why was your dad traveling the world? Was it for work or for pleasure? Was it, are you on an exploration walkabout? Yeah, no, my father was, uh, he actually started his career as a used car salesman and uh, had gas stations and used car dealerships, but he liked to travel. So he developed an import-export business. So that was his way of, I guess, riding off the cost of traveling overseas every year. And uh, he invited me to go along with him. And uh, it was a great opportunity for me to see the world at a young age. And was he putting you to work or were you too young at that point? Too young. Well, I, I was going to college. I was studying to be an accountant of all things, uh. which is really not what I was, you know, I, I'm more of a, I like working around people and interacting with people and accounting is not necessarily that forte. All right. So it sounded like as you, as you got later on there, you were mainly uh, kind of in an employee, uh, on an employee track until this gentleman came and sort of forced you into the ownership track. Exactly. So, and obviously, you know, the stereotype, sorry, accountants out there is that they're risk adverse and, and obviously being an entrepreneur is, is risk heavy. So, Tell me about that mindset shift that you had going from, we'll call it the accounting mindset, sorry, again, accountants, to running something on your own. Yeah, well, I, the accounting never worked for me, so I was never really inspired. That's why to have a chance to travel the world with my father was a great out at the time. And I'd also studied uh, computer uh, systems development. Uh, that wasn't for me either. So the opportunity to travel the world and then land a job in a fitness center where you're actually dealing with people, helping people working on your feet became a great industry for me, something I really enjoyed. And I think uh, I was well suited for it because I, I had an outgoing personality. And what about the risk element? The risk element didn't kick in right away because when the gentleman came into the club and offered to back me in a, in a business, he had 51%. The fellow's name was Jack Hall. He had an, a home improvement business in Lakeland. Jack Hall, the aluminum king was his brand. So anyway, he put up, uh, it was 109,000 in cash to start the first lifestyle club. He had 51% of the stock, I had 49. I had no problem with him having a majority because he knew nothing about the fitness business. And uh, our first year was a big success. We uh, got started very, very well. And uh, I went home to Australia to see my family. When I came back, he voted me out of the management. He thought, you know, this is an easy business. He knew how to run it, blah, blah, blah. So I, at that time, was already independent. So I started consulting for about four or five other independent club operations. And Jack Hall ran the business into the ground. Uh, and uh, after, and I sued him, of course, to get my interest back, my 49% ownership interest, because the company had a, a value at that time. And he said, look, I'll, I'll give you the business um, for nothing if you'll pay me back my 109000 And my attorney said, well, if, you, if you're going to buy the business, you should buy the land as well. You know, if you're going to go broke, go broke big. So <laughs> I ended up signing a note to buy the business 
Lifestyle Family Fitness, the first location, zero money down, $109,000, payable out of 50% of the net profit. And I had a three-year option to buy the land, which at the time was worth $625,000. Wow. So the good news was I paid him off in about uh, two and a half years, and I bought the land, and that became the beginning of, of Lifestyle. And yeah, sure, there's a, there's a high level of risk, but if you know what you're doing, that risk is minimalized. So what do you think it was about, you know, it's strange that Jack would come in and were you talking to him about the business or what was it you think that him seeing you as an employee in this independent shop made him want to pull you out of that and make you, you know, make you run his business? Well, I, I, our staff often are picked off by our members because they see how they work and interact with people. And I think Jack had been a health club member for his entire life. So he knew, I think he recognized the fact that I had some skills and ability in that area. Uh, what made him recruit me, I don't know, other than the fact that he had just been watching me and uh, made that offer. And can you talk about that first conversation? What Did he come right out with it, or did you sort of have some, did you meander into it? How did that? No, no, he went straight to the point and said, I've, uh, I'd like to uh, back you in Lakeland and buy a piece of property and uh, have you be my partner. So, yeah, it was very straightforward, and uh, that was an easy decision for me. I was being paid well at the time, but there was no shortfall in cash flow. He agreed to pay me what I was making. And uh, by me using my home as a co-guarantor on the note for the real estate around his property, you know, I had skin in the game. And I think that's what he wanted, wanted to make sure I was locked in. I mean, Lifestyle grew to be a very successful chain. Tell me about how the brand was formed and what were your, what were your motivations in the name and how you positioned it in, in, the, in the workout community. Yeah, that was a, it was a great company. And uh, from that first club, which that was in 1982, when I actually signed the note to buy him out. It was the same night that that Hurricane Elena hit uh, St. Petersburg. I remember distinctly. So that was 1982. That was the start of Lifestyle. And uh, so basically I had bought a business for 109000 Certainly didn't have any extra cash flow because I just paid him that amount of money over two and a half years. So when you go to banks back in the day, they said, look, we don't lend to uh, health clubs, bowling alleys, and churches. You don't have sustainable cash flow. And there was some truth to that because a lot of members prepaid uh, two years in advance, 40% of the business was prepaid. It was a very difficult uh, time in the fitness business. None of the cardio equipment existed that exists today, but nevertheless, we survived. So how did I open the next location? The second location opened in Winter Haven in 1985. And that was uh, by borrowing money against my home equity and by credit card debt, hmm. strictly out of those two resources. And of course, personally guaranteeing a lease. And uh, so there's a high level of risk associated with all of that, but it worked perfectly. And the Winter Haven Club uh, was a success. And uh, that was in 1985. And uh, third location was in Brandon. That was a signature club. And uh, the Brandon Club was actually bigger than the first two. And it was an uh, interesting story. The fellow that owned it, it was American Fitness Center. So if any of your listeners know American Fitness Center, that was a big brand back in the, uh, in the 90s. Anyway, that he had this one club and he sold it to me for ten dollars, provided I picked up the lease obligation. He wanted to get out from the; uh, it was losing money for him, and uh, nothing worked in the club. They didn't have have basic supplies like toilet paper. And I thought, if all these members love this club and still go to this club with all these headaches, it's got to be a good deal. So I bought that club, and that doubled the size of the company back in 1991. Again, one club in Lakeland, one club in Winter Haven, and buying a 24,000-square-foot club in Brandon. And you're still 100% owner at this point? Yep, 100% owner. And uh, I gave away a little bit of equity to the girl that was running my club, not a significant amount, just on those first three locations. Then uh, opened another club in Lakeland. I had three clubs in Lakeland. This is not a big town. Stupid move <laughs> when I think about it. But anyway, I had a club on the north side, the south side, and the center of Lakeland. But we dominated the we town. Dominated, yeah. yeah, and that was a clever marketing strategy. And then Bally had chosen to close down its locations. It had one in Tyrone, one in Seminole, one on Gandy. And uh, I was a member of the one of Tyrone. I knew all about it. And uh, that was 38,000 square feet. And uh, they shut down on a Sunday night. I reopened on a Monday morning at 5 a.m. Again, financing, refinancing my home, credit card debt, no bank financing, none and uh, equipment leases. So at this point, were you doing that because there wasn't, you didn't want to give up equity or you didn't feel like you could get it at a good valuation? Just, why did you decide to go that route instead of, of trying to sell more of the company? Uh, I'm not a big fan of giving away stock unnecessarily. I, I like to do things alone for the most part. I think uh, having too many investors uh, can be a problem. And I think there's different motivations with investors. So 
at the time. If I was able to pay for it out of debt, happy to do it. So again, at that time, I had four locations. All of the square footage combined didn't equal the size of Tyrone. So it was another double. And that 38,000 square foot club absolutely killed it. We re-enrolled all the members. They all knew me. High level of uh, confidence that we would manage the club well. And that was a turnaround. So now I'd gone from a small town like Lakeland to a bigger town at the time in Brandon to the metro area of Tyrone, Maine and Maine in Pinellas County. And that club did extremely well. And then subsequent to that, opened up the Seminole Club, which is the old Valley and Seminole, just a new lease, uh, inexpensive lease. That club was a huge success. And then the Carrollwood location. And that took us up to about seven locations, maybe eight. And uh, then I'd heard that Ray Wilson was coming into town. And uh, Ray Wilson was the 800-pound gorilla in our industry. He had opened up 600 gyms in his lifetime, including European health spas and a number of different brands at the time. And he had just sold 87 clubs in California to a guy by the name of Mark Bastroff, who had a brand called 24-Hour Nautilus. And that became 24-Hour Fitness, which today is the second largest club operation in the U.S. And uh, so now this guy that's the king of California, the mecca of health club industry, is coming to Tampa to open up four mega clubs. I thought, oh, I'm going to go out of business. This guy's going to crush me. So I called him up and I said, uh, hey, Ray, um, I've met you from time to time. You probably don't remember me, but can we work together? And he, he contacted his wife at the time and say, honey, I've got the competition on the phone and we're not even in Tampa yet. Anyway, I ended up uh, making a good connection with this guy, made a friend, and uh, we ended up doing all of his back-end accounting. We did his payroll, his billing, his accounts payable. He didn't have a home office. Remember, he just sold 87 clubs. One son came to Tampa, which is Perry, to open up Wilson's Athletic Club. And the other son went to Columbus, Ohio, to open up California Family Fitness. They couldn't work in that bureaucracy that now became 24-hour fitness. Mm -hmm. So the youngest son uh, opened up the first club. We were doing all of his accounting and back end, and they were selling memberships month to month. Now, remember, the health club industry back at this time in the 90s was all one-year, two-year, three-year contracts. That's what Bally's membership agreement was like five pages long, as was ours. So we made the shift. We thought we can do better than they were doing with this model. So we shifted to a month-to-month membership model. And back in 1999, that was unheard of, that you could actually get members to pay without locking them into a two-year contract. But it was a game changer for us. And our business blew up. We had more members joining. People were leaving quicker, but they were happy. There was no black eye with a long-term contract. And, um, Our business exploded. We opened up another club. Now we're up to about nine or 10 locations. And then a friend of mine, a local successful businessman, Stuart Lasher, had a company called Quantum that ended up investing in our growth. And uh, they started with an initial uh, debt offering of about $2.5 million. It was convertible to equity. And we accelerated our growth exponentially. So uh, the gentleman who sold the, uh, well, the California clubs. Yeah, that was uh, Ray Wilson, yes. Ray Wilson. Yeah. So did he open the clubs, and how did that affect your business here in Tampa? Uh, Well, he opened up that first club, Wilson's Athletic Club, which is on Hillsborough Avenue. That was in 1993. That's the same year I opened up the Seminole Club. And uh, we outperformed him, actually. And uh, it was a tragic story. His son had been married for 11 years, had a lot of money in the bank, but he was distraught because his wife was leaving him. He put a gun to his head and shot himself. Mm -hmm. And the dad, Ray, would never come back to Tampa. So we agreed to buy his business and continue to do the back end for the other son that was in Ohio. Right, and that was just one club in Ohio. That grew to four clubs in Ohio, but only one ever opened in Tampa when his son took his life. And I think I remember seeing that, uh, yeah. So I want to back up a little bit. Um, yeah. The lifestyle brand, uh, it was a very strong brand. Yeah. And you mentioned this was sort of pre-cardio. You know, were there sort of buckets or uh, silos of the types of clubs? I mean, I remember Gold's Gym. Were there clubs that were more get healthy versus clubs that were more get, get jacked, basically? And so where did lifestyle seek to, to play in that space? And what was the space then? Well, um, Prior to taking on the investment capital, we were a bit of a hodgepodge. We had some clubs that were 12,000 square feet, some clubs that were 25. Thai room was 38,000 square feet. The basic formula was very similar. Strength equipment, which is all your selectorized equipment and free weights. Of course, cardio equipment. But back in the 90s, the cardio equipment was nothing like it is today, but it still had a strong basis. And then, of course, we also had pools and 
uh, saunas and steam rooms and things of that nature. And then all of that morphed in the years beginning 2000, and the clubs became dry. The pools went away, racquetball went away, mm. the steam rooms went away. So basically, it became a much more simplified version. And uh, the lifestyle model was about 25,000 square feet. The model I work in today is about 22,000. So that for us is the sweet spot for fitness, about 25,000 square feet. So to answer your question, all the clubs through the end of the 90s were a little bit of a hodgepodge. Some of them were Bally, some of them were different brands. Oh, they were different brands. But we reopened. Okay. And then from that point forward, we were pretty much fixated on this 25,000 square foot model. And then with how much of that? So you know, I think of Gold, they have the logo of the guy that's very strong. It's a strong name, Gold. Yeah. And Lifestyle is more of a softer name. And so how did you position against them to capture the strength market? Yeah, we were what they weren't. In other words, they were very heavy on strength, uh, real fitness, real results was one of their catchphrases. We wanted to be known more as a family, a community center. So we embraced all generations. We had programs for seniors. We had a heavy insurance paid element to our clubs. We had adults and uh, we gave free memberships to teenagers during the summer months. So we had all three generations in our clubs. And I think we reduced or, or lowered the barrier to entry. I think a lot of people get intimidated about going into a gym. So our, our whole objective was to make people feel comfortable whether you're a man, whether you're a woman, whether you're a senior, whether you're a teen, everyone fit in. And that was some, somewhat groundbreaking, right? Because now there's there are whole chains that are just judgment-free is a big tagline and things like that. So Correct. you were the, kind of the first people to really do that. Right. And remember, we were the first brand to be month-to-month, -month, no long-term contracts. This is a, at a time when Bally and uh, all the brands, everyone had two-year contracts, sometimes three-year contracts. So we were the first brand to have month-to-month, -month, and that was a game-changer. Am I right? I have a feeling, and I don't know if it's just because of the news I've received, but it feels like the industry in general, I know at the employee level, but even at the ownership level, turns over a lot. You know, I look at the LA Fitnesses, I think at an old lifestyle that's on 4th Street here in St. Pete. Yep, that is. And I remember that just, it seems like chains are getting bought and sold and rebranding a lot, more so than I think of other industries. Is that true? I don't think so. No, I think uh, when you look at uh, the mix of the leaders today, LA Fitness continues. Well, first of all, Planet Fitness is the biggest operation in the world with about, uh, in the US with about 1,700 open locations, but that's a franchise operation. They're not company owned and operated. The largest company owned and operated business is LA Fitness. Now, LA Fitness hasn't changed much over the last 10 years. They've, uh, if anything, their model is smaller today. They've eliminated racquetball from a lot of their clubs. Some of their clubs don't have pools. And I think they're feeling a lot of competition because their clubs are a little bigger. Therefore, they've got to be at that mid price point, that $29 to $39 price point. When you say Gold's Gym, I think is going through a state of change. Omni bought them a, a year ago and uh, we're going to sell them. Now they've decided to keep them and leverage the legacy of the brand. But no, I don't know that a lot. I think the independents come and go, and that's the challenge of any industry. The franchise and the larger company-owned stores seem to be doing well. Cool. Can you talk about the time? Uh, I'm going to jump back into the timeline. So um, first with Jack Hall pulling you out of where you were working, starting the company, and then booting you. So I'll talk about that a little bit um, when that happened. And then how long was it before basically, and we'll just say it, he came crawling back, right? So talk about that time period. Uh, let me see. The company started in 1982, and uh, I bought him out in 1985, September 1 of 1985. I think that's when Hurricane Elena came through. So that three years was a period where the first year was great. The club got started up and performed very well in the first year. Then the anguish of being taken out of my position and having to reset and you know become a consultant and file suit, and then the satisfaction of him selling the business back to me for nothing down for what he had in it. So what was the conversation like when he, I mean, obviously you had 49%, but you're new to, you know, being an owner in something. Did he come at you with the same bluntness that he did when he asked you to, to join him just to say you're out? No, he was, uh, he was an arrogant, uh, confident guy. And I learned that he thought there's no way that I pay him the 109 grand. So it was his way of getting me out completely because he struggled with the business after he took it out away out of my hands. He thought that there's no way that I could get the business back on its feet. So he thought that that was his way of um, taking 100% control because I had to guarantee that note with my home and everything else. And was that directly tied? Do you think that pressure came from, A, him being a little bit uh, you know, unhappy about having how the business was performing without you, but then also the legal pressure you put on him? 
Uh, well, I'm sure the legal pressure played a role because I had a, every, a, a very valid suit, but I think he was more frustrated with the fact that he knew nothing about the business. The business looks like it's easy to run from a distance, but there's a lot of bits and pieces that go into it. So I don't think he took that into account. So tell me, what, are, what do you think are those bits and pieces? What are the things that people like him don't get about how hard it is to run that business? Well, I've often said to the people I work with, there's a million little bits and pieces that go into running this business like anything else. Uh, but obviously, your first objective is to get people to join. Your second objective is to get people to stay. And your third objective is to eliminate any waste. And you've got to have a very strong marketing program. You've got to know how to drive traffic through the door. So those three components are the primary components, but then there's a lot of other elements that go into it. You've got to understand all the back-end functions, how to manage your payroll, how to bill, how to collect. Obviously, all those functions are important. You've got club maintenance, club equipment, CapEx, all those different components. But the primary drivers, new members joining, keeping those members happy and extending their length of stay, and of course, uh, driving traffic through the door. All right, so let's pick back up. Then you were at, uh, I think, nine stores at the where we left off? Yeah, nine stores. This is back in 2000 when Quantum uh, ended up making an investment uh, with the goal of uh, accelerating the growth exponentially. And uh, we did that uh, almost immediately. I know that I had a $12 million revenue on that particular year, and we spent a million dollars on payroll, which, in other words, I completely trusted the wisdom of the people that I was working with. And at that time, we hired a, a CFO that was a game changer. He had a $150,000 base, a VP of operations, a guy named Dave Carney, who's now the president of Orange Theory. So a VP of sales, a COO, about four or five C-level players to manage the growth. And one thing that was taught to me was hire the people in advance of the growth. If you're a 10-club chain today and you're going to grow to 50, hire the guys that have run 100 clubs so that they don't get stressed or overwhelmed by the growth factor. So uh, we hired this, those C-level players, then we went out and selected sites. Uh, we grew through both Greenfield, which are, is obviously a new build, and acquisition. And uh, I can't recall how many clubs we opened in 2001, but uh, we grew to 55 locations by 2008. So over that eight-year stretch, we grew from 10 locations to 55 locations. That's 45 clubs over what, uh, eight years. So it was a massive growth curve. So following your own advice, you weren't a person who had opened 100 shops. So did you feel that stress? <laughs> it was fun. We were doing very, very well. So there was nothing to be stressed about. I think my peers that have been in this business back in the day when it was very difficult, we always were struggling to make payroll on Friday. We've all had this conversation, my partner Vince Julian and I and many others. You know, that's how it was back in the early days. But once you understand the business model and you have sustainable, predictable cash flow, those issues no longer become a concern. The only thing that really has ever worried me since that period is people. You know, at the end of the day, that's what the business is built on, human capital. So you never want to lose a great player and uh, you always want to be able to attract good players. So. And did you spend a lot of time digging into you know, how did you apply that understanding to your hiring processes? It was drilled into us that you had to have eight players on the bus. So without a doubt, the hiring and recruiting of key people played a momentous role. At the end of the day, my strength is sales and marketing. But remember, I'd grown to nine or 10 clubs under my own horsepower. I had a great controller who actually to this day is now the number three person at LA Fitness. So obviously she was a dynamic employee that started at $25,000 a year and eventually made 125K with me. Now she's probably making double that with LA, but it was just she and I. And uh, when I hired the CFO, he came from Echo Drugs, a $9 billion industry, and he was the number three guy reporting to the CFO. And uh, his name is Todd Bright, and he's one of my best friends, and he was a game changer. So I had all the strength in sales and marketing. He had all the strengths in finance, forecasting, raising debt, eliminating the need to give up equity, all the different issues, managing attrition, reporting, analytics, just a game changer. And uh, he worked in the CFO role. I was the CEO and uh, we were surrounded by one of the best teams in the, in the industry. You know, our retail manager that we tried to get into the selling uh, smoothies and uh, retail products. We had about six locations. Failed at it miserably, but the person that oversaw that was a guy named David Long. David Long founded and is the CEO of Orange Theory today. That's a great story. Yeah. That, that would be a person that you should interview. I will. <laughs> Can you make an introduction for me? <laughs> cool. So then at some point, uh, it sounds like 
you exited lifestyle, and let's talk about that next. Well, first of all, that growth was uh, a fascinating period. Um, we grew to about uh, 250,000 uh, members, and uh, our revenue, I think, was about $150 million at the time. We had uh, 33 clubs in the Tampa Bay, Orlando market, and we had clubs in Indiana, Indianapolis. We ended up buying Ray Wilson's other son's operation in Columbus, Ohio. That was a four-club group that uh, eventually grew to 10 locations. We bought that group, and we opened up in North Carolina in Raleigh and, uh, and Charlotte. Did you rebrand the group in Ohio or keep it? Everything was lifestyle. Everything was lifestyle family fitness. We also went to a hub-and-spoke model where um, we ended up putting in 50,000-square-foot clubs in the center of the market and then surrounded it with 25,000-square-foot clubs. Weren't uh, overjoyed with the results of that. Uh, wouldn't do that again, but uh, it was something that we tested. We didn't do as well in the northern markets that we did in the Florida market. I think in the Florida market, we were all homegrown. I think there's a lot to be said for being a local company. And locally, we were known. On the radio, we were known. Uh, we were known in the community. And uh, we just didn't have that power in the other markets. So it was always a struggle trying to get uh, traction in these northern markets. And what do you hope to achieve? I, mean, I guess it's somewhat straightforward, but with the hub and spoke model, what's sort of the logic behind that as far as your position? Is that kind of a Lakeland vibe where you're, you're dominating that way? or No, the logic was that all the people in the surrounding clubs would want to upgrade to a multi-club membership. So they had access to the bigger club that had pools and racquetball and all the different components that didn't get in a 25,000 square foot club. And we didn't get that kind of uh, multi-club access lift that we expected. So we should have stayed focused on 25,000 square feet and built two clubs instead of one. Got it. <laughs> okay, so on, on to the, your parting ways with... Yeah, uh, so, so those years, uh, obviously the economy tightened up in 2008. We slowed our growth at that particular time. The investors had now been in for eight years. And investors obviously don't want to keep their money in forever because they get diminishing returns. So... Uh, with the market uh, slowing down and there being less IPO action, the question came, what would the exit be? And Todd Bright would be the better face of the organization dealing with the street, uh, dealing with lenders and investors. So I moved into um, co-chair of the board, found a title. He took over the CEO role and uh, another gentleman became the president. And that continued on for three more years. And then the companies up north were purchased by Lifetime Fitness, which is probably the second or third largest operation in the country based on sales volume. They have 120,000 square foot clubs, 150,000 square foot clubs, six times bigger than us, but they wanted to get into the 30,000 square foot space. So they liked our customer service philosophy and our operation, our look. They bought all of our clubs in Indianapolis, North Carolina, and Ohio, which left the Florida clubs with... Uh, under Lifestyle. They were sold to LA Fitness in 2012. I obviously voted against the sale because I started the company. I didn't want to see the clubs get sold, but I was outvoted at the time. But uh, yeah, that was a very sad time. We had an unbelievable culture at Lifestyle. Uh, the employees love to go to work. To this day, we still have a Facebook page, LFF Friends, and uh, about a thousand people uh, post pictures and stories. It's, it's amazing that heritage, that, uh, that culture that we created and the love people had for that brand. And that still exists today. We've got members of Lifestyle that are using crunch clubs that talk about that as well. But regardless, uh, you know, it was time to move on. And uh, so those clubs were sold. I had a non-compete um, that was going to go for three years with LA and five years with Lifetime. So I had to get back in the business. So I ended up buying back two of my clubs in Columbus, thinking that I could uh, develop a, a new brand again, which I did. What did you do for the three years that you were on the board? So you moved out of an active CEO role. And what were those three years like? Oh, for yeah, you it was great. I loved it. I mean, I loved Todd. Kind of leisurely uh, life. There was no disconnect from the company. I, it wasn't like I went and bought a boat and yeah. set sail. I, my goal was uh, like Colonel Sanders. I had to go out there and shake hands and attend the grand openings and do the PR events and right. get behind that uh, teen initiative in the summer. And no, I was still very active. It's just that uh, I didn't need to deal with the day to day. And uh, But I still actively attended all the board meetings and yeah, there was no lack of uh, momentum, just uh, not in the day-to-day. -day. And then was there a gap between the sale and when you bought back the Columbus clubs? No, it was simultaneously. So when Lifetime was buying the Northern clubs, they didn't want two of those clubs in Columbus. Demographically, one didn't fit their mold and the other one was too small and uh, they were ideal for me. So I picked up those two clubs and uh, reinvented them as Aussie fit. So we created a culture that was all built around the uh, 
Australia, and uh, it was a lot of fun. I had an Aussie, a uh, couple of Aussies working in there, and uh, but I didn't like going to Columbus, Ohio. It, you know, it's freezing cold in the winter, and uh, one of the reasons I stepped out of the day-to-day at Lifestyle to spend more time with my kids, and I'm up there one week of the month, I thought this was not a smart move. But regardless, the uh, clubs were successful, and uh, while I was up there, actually beginning in about 2000, after the uh, turn down in the economy, you saw the emergence of the low-cost, high-value category in fitness. And this is when Planet Fitness was starting to get traction with about three or 400 clubs. UFIT was evolving here locally. In fact, the founder of UFIT, Rick Burks, created uh, the Planet Fitness brand in, down in Miami. And he sold those clubs to the Grundles, who still are the people that operate Planet Fitness. And then he reinvented uh, UFIT, which UFIT is like a knockoff of Planet. So those two brands were doing very well, and uh, we could all see what was going on. I had a lot of friends that were also getting into the HVLP, the high-value, low-price category, and I wanted to get into into it as well. And uh, my competitor in the Tampa Bay market, a a gentleman named Vince Julian, who had a brand called Shapes Family Fitness, he and I had competed for 30, 35 years, but we were friends, respectful uh, friends you know, in the same industry, but uh, we liked each other. And we used to get together about every six weeks and we'd tell each other how we're doing and uh, how the clubs were performing. And quite often it's cyclical, you know, and it mirrored each other. But we had a lot of respect for each other because we cared about the people first. And uh, when you, like any business, if you put the people first, everything else falls into place. And uh, he wasn't crazy about the women's only business. Women, Women are very hard to please. And uh, so he ended up starting a chain of clubs called Southside Athletic Club back in 2002, 2003, grew those to four locations in Sarasota, Bradenton. And we ended up acquiring those under Lifestyle. And that's when I got to know Vince better. Mm. And uh, in fact, uh, we almost lost the deal because he was concerned about how his people were going to be treated. And I had to assure him that they would be treated respectfully and uh, all of those different things. And uh, he and I became better friends as a result of that transaction. So again, this is 2005 when we bought those four clubs. So now flash forward to 2014, I've got my two clubs in Ohio and Vince told me that he had bought the rights to Crunch Fitness for the West Coast of Florida. And uh, he told me that uh, he looked at Planet, uh, he looked at UFIT and uh, he liked Crunch the best because it was emerging And he felt that as an entrepreneur, we're both entrepreneurs, he had some freedom to develop programs and systems that he wouldn't have with Planet or UFIT. And he felt that uh, UFIT was more of a commodity-based program without a lot of specific differentiators, whereas Crunch had a great history. And I'll be happy to share that with you if you're interested, but Crunch is a spectacular brand. Let's talk about it, yeah. Yeah, well, so back to the 90s. Crunch started early in the 90s, maybe 1989. It was a basement gym operation in New York City. And uh, the guy that started the brand was a Wall Street banker. And uh, he didn't ever consider himself a health club operator. And uh, anyway, he was very edgy, but he, he built his brand around group fitness programming, which at the time was called aerobics, and personal training. And both of these categories were very hot back in the 90s. He had movie star trainers. Billy Blanks uh, was a hot commodity back in the 90s. He taught aerobics for him. He had his own Crunch Live TV show that appeared each week on TV. He had a recording studio in his club. He really didn't care what people thought about him. His group fitness classes, he had the gospel choir workout. So he brought gospel singers into a group fitness studio and they sung while the people did aerobics. Now, this was probably all a staged event for PR that appeared on CNN or Fox or whatever was the mainstream media at the time, but he was a a media guru. And uh, he had uh, the stripper pole workout. He developed that, which we now call the stiletto workout. We don't have the stripper poles, but that's what he created. He had peekaboo showers, frosted showers in his clubs, which still exist today, where you can see the silhouette of the person showering. So uh, he had a lot more more programs going on, but um, he ended up growing that company in major markets. So he was in New York City, LA, Chicago, Miami. I think he had an overseas operation. He grew that to about 13 locations. Then he ended up buying six in Atlanta, six big clubs, a little bit off brand. And then he sold those 19 or 20 clubs to Bally in 1998, I believe, for $91 million. And uh, to this day, he continues to be a friend. He's a guy that I really admire. So he got basically, 
what, four and a half million dollars a club, which is a huge value back in the day. And Bally, of course, ran the name straight into the ground. They uh, took some of the Bally clubs, rebranded them as Crunch because they had two clubs in the same market. But the culture went away. The innovation went away. The edginess went away. And, um, and Bally ruined the brand. So you look like you have something to say. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I'm just, I'm just, I just keep thinking. I'm, I'm still not convinced that there's not a lot of action in this marketplace because every couple of sentences, it's like a new chain here, got sold to here, flipped to there, rebranded to here. Well, you, you got to realize fitness is hot. You know, it's gone from 12% market share 12 years ago to almost 20%. So one out of every five Americans belongs to a gym. Right. And uh, you've got all the, look at Peloton and all these sub brands, then all the boutiques, they're exploding. So yeah, as more people sit on their backside all day at home in front of a laptop, the need to get out and clear your head, you know, that's another reason to work out. It used to be weight loss, meeting people, getting fit, getting stronger. Now you just need to get your head clear. So yeah, fitness is exponentially growing. So I don't think it's so much brands closing, it's brands innovating. Yeah. So now he sold his 19 Crunch Fitnesses to Bally. I'm assuming the Atlanta ones were Crunch as well? The Atlanta clubs were Sports Life. They became Crunch. Became Crunch. And now they became Bally. Yes. So did he sell the ones just up north or the ones in Atlanta as well? He sold all 19 all over the country. All, all went to Bally. And the brand went to Bally as well, Crunch. The brand went to Bally. Now, remember, Bally kept the Crunch brand on, on most of the clubs, but some of the clubs, they changed to Bally, and some of the Bally changed to Crunch. All right, so then what happened? Well, then Bally spiraled down. Remember, Bally had the three-year contract. It was all based on installment sales. They borrowed against the... It was just a, a financial mess. And uh, Bally eventually started selling off, and I think they sold 150 two clubs to LA Fitness for 170 million. That was about three years ago. And that left them with about 40 clubs. And uh, those 40 clubs were bought by a company called Nev, New Evolution Ventures. Nev was led by Mark Mastroff. If you recall, Mark Mastroff had the 34 clubs called 24-Hour Nautilus. He bought the 87 clubs from Ray Wilson to form 24-Hour Fitness. 24-Hour Fitness grew from those 115 clubs to 450, and he got pushed out. A private equity group took over the company. He got pushed out. So Mark Mastroff formed a company called New Evolution Ventures. Nev owns, or owns, yeah, owns Madonna's Hard Candy, Stan Nash Fitness in Canada, UFC Gyms, LA Boxing. They bought those ballet clubs, and that included the rights to the crunch name. Then he pulled some people out of Planet that used to work for him at 24-Hour Fitness and reinvented Crunch as a low-price, high-value brand. And this was back in 2007, 2008. And my partner now, at that time my competitor, Vince Julian, had the foresight to buy the rights to Crunch on the west coast of Florida, and he opened his first club in Naples, Florida in about 2009, I believe. And uh, so that club blew up. Did fantastically well, sold more members in one year that we sold in 90% of our lifestyle clubs in full maturity. And uh, he ended up selling that club after uh, a year and a half. Uh, he did that with his partner, Tony Scramali, who also worked with us at Lifestyle, but originally worked for Vince with uh, Southside Athletic Clubs. So Vince and Tony sold that club down in Naples and bought open clubs in Sarasota, Bradenton. And the first two clubs were on Bee Ridge Road and... Uh, also in the university area, and those opened in 2012. Then they picked up my old Carrollwood location that um, LA Fitness had shut down, and then they picked up my old Bloomingdale club that LA Fitness had shut down. And I distinctly remember that because Vince sent me a text. Uh, I was in Ohio on September 1 of 2014. He sends me a text saying, we just picked up your Bloomingdale club. Man, you built a nice club. And that's a, like a punch in the stomach <laughs> because when you have when you build these clubs, it's like having children. You, you love every one of them, and that was a fabulous club. And I didn't talk to him for a little while after that. <laughs> and then uh, he reached out to me and said, "What you know? You're eventually going to come back to Florida. Why don't we partner up?" And uh, that's what I did in 2015. Made a decision to sell my two clubs and uh, joined up with Vince Julian and his team, which consisted of he and uh, Tony Scramali. Uh, Tony oversees all the sales side of the business and Jeff Dotson, his CFO, for 29 years. And uh, so the four of us joined together, and um, we immediately uh, picked up the old Tampa Palms Club that I had, and then we set our minds to, uh, originally it was going to be a four or five club chain, but we knew right away this was a home run. The crunch brand, the edginess of the brand, uh, very popular with millennials. The target audience in this uh, category is millennials. 
68% of our members are 34 years of age or younger. And we knew the market. We knew the Florida. We knew Tampa Bay. We knew Orlando. So we immediately bought the rights to Atlanta, which is the obviously the eighth largest market in the country. We were excited to be able to own the development rights for that such a hot trade area. We had Orlando. We had Tampa Bay. We were set. We could build 100 clubs. And uh, so with that, we um, went about growing relatively quickly. Last year, at the end of 2017, we had 11 clubs open. So growing in 2014, there were four clubs open. At the end of 2015, we probably added three that year, three the next year. Grew to 11 clubs by the end of 2017. Then last year, we opened up seven locations. So virtually, last year was unbelievable. 53% increase in revenue, 50% increase in personal training revenue, and uh, about an 80% increase in size. And uh, this year, we plan to open another six to eight locations. We opened one in January in Riverview, and uh, we have clubs uh, under construction in uh, two in Orlando and one in Atlanta. So yeah, we should be every bit of a uh, 25, 28 club uh, operation by the end of this year. So other than being budget-friendly, high value, and the mechanics of it, what's changed since your lifestyle days to your crunch days? It's more consumer friendly. Uh, even at Lifestyle, your membership price average probably was $34, $39 a month. Some of the premier clubs like on 4th Street North and Hyde Park, they had memberships of $48 uh, a month. So today, fitness, uh, the expectation is I shouldn't have to pay that kind of price for fitness. So our members can join for $9.95, $21.95, or $24.95 a month. Half of them join for $9.95 and half of them join for the other two programs. But they're getting a better club a brand new club, Lifestyle obviously was at various stages of development, $850,000 worth of brand new equipment, 55 group fitness classes a week. We averaged about 35 at Lifestyle a week, but you get 55 classes a week. The group fitness programming is spectacular. Crunch was built on group fitness, so they have a lot of enterprise value there that they uh, leverage. We also have massive turf areas in the clubs where members can do uh, kettlebell workouts, uh, smash bag workouts, all those different uh, activities, prowlers. We have um, power racks. Every conceivable type of toy that a young exerciser would want is available in a crunch club. So it's not about the $10 a month, which is actually technically $9.95 a month gives you access to that $2 million gym with $850,000 in equipment. $21.95 includes the access to all the group fitness classes. $24.95 $24.95 a month gives you all of that, plus unlimited hydro massage, tanning, and the right to bring a friend with you every visit for free. So it's huge, huge value. And uh, that's the difference between the lifestyle model. The employees, very much the same. The members uh, mirror the community. They're very much the same. Crunch might skew younger by about three years, I think. But regardless, it's very evident that Crunch is a killer brand. And uh, very different to a planet. I have a lot of respect for Planet Fitness. I've got a friend that's got 62 of them. I think Planet does a great job of expanding the market because they're friendly to the overweight, deconditioned population, but they put limitations on the weights, things of that nature, which is all good, where we appeal to the active exerciser. They appeal to the inactive first to exercise. And I think those two brands combined really own that HVLP category. Are you going to bring the smoothies back? <laughs> No, no, we'd never do that again. We're not good at that. We're not good at uh, running kids' clubs. We're good at building fabulous clubs and uh, running clean, well-maintained operations. And uh, yeah, we're good at that. I appreciate you sharing your story. It was it was a fun one to listen to. I, I appreciate it. And we'll continue to watch and enjoy your success. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.